please welcome to the stage the executive director of the FinOps Foundation, J.R. Storman. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I'm impressed that all of you got up so early in Spain. This is great to see you all bright and awake. Welcome to FinOps X Europe. It's really fantastic to be here. Uh, I spent a lot of time here in like 2017 and 2018 coming to meet practitioners doing the early work that we now call FinOps in this city. And so many of you in different places I saw around that era uh, back in 2018 or 19, we were figuring out what this whole discipline was. So I'm really excited to be here to talk about where it's going and to have this group here as part of it. So, welcome home. Why do I say this? This is one of the only places in the world, despite all of you speaking a lot of different languages, that you all speak the language of FinOps. Everyone knows what you do, even those who travel from far, far away, like Japan. Uh, everyone knows what you do here. Everyone is able to talk to you about the discipline, the work that you're doing. You can talk about your challenges. You can talk about what's working well and not. Now, this event, we have the entire hotel. So we have a buyout on the whole hotel, and that's important because I want you to remember that every space you're in, whether you're out by the pool or in the coffee shop or in the breakfast area, they're all FinOps people. So talk to each other. And to get us started on that, we're going to do some connecting. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and you're going to introduce yourself to two people who you did not come with or you don't know around you. Are you ready? Set. Go. Okay, one more, one more. Oh, hey, yes. Hi. Happy you part. I've met you before in London. Oh, yeah, good to see you. Yeah, thank you. All right, time is up. Time is up. Bring it all back together. I know it's exciting, so many new faces. So we have people here from 25 different countries from Europe, from North America, from Asia, from South America, from all over the world. Everyone's come together. Everyone's very excited. I'm going to keep talking until you stop talking. Here we go. All right, so I'm moving forward. I'm clicking the button. Here we go. Boom. So those people that you have met, keep talking to them in the halls. When you pass them at breakfast, talk to them there. This is what this is all about. I always think I can do this in 30 seconds, and it's always like two minutes. I love it. Woo! Very good to you. Uh, I love that. That's my favorite part of the conference. OK. Uh, so we, we are, uh, we're the FinOps Foundation, uh, if you haven't figured that out already. Uh, and we're a part of the Linux Foundation. So the Linux Foundation uh, is a, a neutral, nonprofit entity based out of the US that is a holder for some of the world's biggest open source technology, like Kubernetes and RISC-V and Linux itself. The Linux kernel sits within our, my coworker is Linus Torvald. He works for the foundation. So our group is the FinOps Foundation, and we're dedicated to the people who advance the value of cloud. We're dedicated to advancing your careers and helping you move forward. So we do this through three areas. The first is connections, right? All of this, what you just did. Uh, the second is education, certifications, and training. Who's FinOps certified? Nice. Woo! Who actually used their Focus Analyst coupon that you got? All right. OK, excellent, excellent. Glad to see that. Uh, the third area is best practices, standards, and specifications. So we're going to be talking a lot about the Focus specification, for example, or the FinOps framework. This is where we do open source materials in those areas. In 2020, we became part of the Linux Foundation. And at that time, four years ago, we had about 1,500 expert community members, which we thought was huge, because the previous year in 2019, we only had 26. There's one of the original 26 right there. Uh, so this was 2020. We trained a couple thousand people. Fast forward to today, we've got 31,000 expert practitioners in the community. We've got over 150 corporate members. We've got almost 40,000 people trained. But the ecosystem around this is growing even more. So the larger set of people, over 60,000 people in the last four years, 
have participated in Finhouse Foundation training or events, come to our, our sessions, and interacted with our projects and open source programs. So this is the community that's expanding. I'm sorry I don't have European numbers up here, but in the US, we represent 49 of the Fortune 50. So some of the biggest companies in the world, biggest cloud spenders. Some of the companies individually representing billions of dollars of cloud spend, but in aggregate, over $300 billion of cloud spend. So a big chunk of the global cloud technology spending. And a little history, in 2020, is Stacy in here? Where's Stacy? Oh, she's not in here, shoot. So when we first started uh, the FinOps Foundation, I, I hired Stacy to be our one full-time employee, thinking, I got this. I only have to be here part of the time. Fast forward four years, the foundation has grown a lot. We're almost 30 people now. Uh, we are in seven countries and our staff alone. We started during COVID, so we're fully remote. Uh, and we're growing. We are, are just opened a new principal product manager role to help us drive focus forward. We're expanding in government community and we're hiring in India right now. And we expect this trend to continue around the world as we see more and more adoption of FinOps. I gotta go back for a second. These people have put months of work into what you're gonna see here. The conversations, the content, the slides, everything. I mean, the beautiful things on the side. So if you see them, give them a big hug or a high five because they have been fantastic and working their butts off. <laughs> Our governing board is made up of uh, the world's largest cloud providers, 90% uh, of the big GSIs doing FinOps in the space, a ton of giant organizations doing FinOps in their practices, and pretty much all the major platforms doing FinOps services or tooling. These people help us drive industry strategy and help us figure out how to invest the funds of the foundation in support of this community. This event, FinOps X Europe, has a set of sponsors. So first of all, big thank you to Microsoft and AWS for being platinum sponsors and helping make all this happen. Out there in the foyer, you'll see a bunch of booths. Those are all the gold sponsors. Please go out there and talk to them. They have brought product leaders. They brought SMEs. They brought their services people. They can help you solve challenges. They can also just talk to you about whatever's going on. So please engage these folks. Tonight, downstairs, there's an expo hall. Go down there all day, anytime you want. But tonight at 4.45 or 5, check your agenda, there's a reception down there. So please go down and talk to them. There's really cool uh, tools and services coming out of these vendors downstairs as well. All right, so this is my deep breath moment. We're actually gonna get into the fun stuff now, talking about FinOps. So a lot of you have been around for a long time. Another one of the original 26 sitting in the front row right here from 2019. Uh, I always wanna start with a reset on the definition. I often forget the details, uh, I forget a lot of things, uh, but what FinOps is really about. So FinOps is an operational framework and cultural practice which maximizes the business value of cloud, enabling timely data-driven decision-making and creates financial accountability through collaboration with engineering, finance, and business teams. Key points, business value, not spending more, not spending less, getting the value out. Timely data-driven decision-making, getting the right data in the right hands of the right people at the speed of the business and speed of cloud to make those decisions, and collaboration, bringing together teams that typically don't work well together or don't work frequently together to have more active conversations to drive that value. The FinOps framework, which many of you have seen, it's been around for about three years. It's in its third or fourth edition. It's meant to be a cyclical loop of ways that you go through principles and capabilities and domains driving business value. And it's got a set of people that interact with this. Remember, FinOps is a people practice around collaboration. So one of the best parts of my job is I get to talk to hundreds of practitioners a year, thousands over the last few years about what's happening. And I wanna get into some of the changes that are occurring right now or have occurred in the last year. First of all, always remember, FinOps was born in cloud. This is critical because cloud is different. It's different in the way it's built. It's different in the way it's procured. It's different in the speed of the granularity and the specialization of the data. Some of your billing files may have built, if you were to look at them in a CSV format, which I don't encourage you doing, they would have billions of commas of charges in one month, right? So this is a very hard problem to solve. So FinOps starts there, and what it really operates as is an intersection point between the business strategy of the business, what do we need to accomplish, goals, revenue, all that stuff, and the technology strategy. How are we gonna implement that? What technology are we gonna build? Where are we gonna ship and deploy and optimize? 
It also goes up and down. So FinOps does executive level reporting if you need it to, rolling up cost centers or business units or CIO, CO level reporting, but it also goes down to the engineering you know, operating room, if you will, you know, getting people to actually make changes. Uh, it's all very based in the idea of Kaizen. Kaizen is continuous improvement, Japanese auto manufacturing concept. The key thing with the continuous improvement is it's not just done by the executives or the people on the bottom. Anybody is empowered at any point to stop the process and make improvements to it. FinOps also works horizontally. It's sort of like a great glass elevator of business value in connecting your business strategy needs with your technology needs and bringing these things back and forth. So it's not just the business lobbing things over to the technology side, technology side going off for months to work on it. It's sending data and enabling that collaboration to get better timely decision making to bring us back to more business value. And this is the true cultural change. But now that cloud has moved out of being you know, a couple percent or 5% or 10% of spending for a lot of organizations, for the big ones moving to 10, 20, or 30%, and for smaller organizations, sometimes being 80 or 90% of their technology spend, we've seen companies start to need to integrate the cloud spend management methodologies back into other parts of the business. And so the FinOps framework, as you know it, right, has these capabilities that do forecasting and allocation. In cloud, we see those applied to public cloud at different types of maturity. So you might start with some things based on your business strategy that you keep in a less mature phase. Some parts of your strategy may need to drive you getting more maturity. You might need to get anomalies in place. Later, you might get better at allocation. Whichever ones sit wherever they go are gonna be based on economic factors, how competitive market it is, how lean you need to be. These are gonna move around. But what we've seen happen in the last couple of years is people get good at this, at driving this fast business value, and invariably the business says, I love what we're doing in cloud. Can you apply this to other types of spend that the business is working on? So instead of cloud teams being siloed off and doing FinOps over here in a corner, they become part of the larger integration and help the business move faster in other ways. The most common place we see that today, and this, is, this data is from last month. We are currently surveying state of FinOps data. You're seeing a very, very, very early preview of the first few hundred responses. 72% of those are doing FinOps in SaaS right now. This change has happened. When they do that, they apply the same methodology, they keep their different capabilities they need in cloud, and they start to drop in different capabilities based on the business needs for SaaS. Might be allocation, might be forecasting, might be optimization. Now, here was the really interesting one we did not expect at the San Diego conference four months ago. We saw a large collection of people, not a majority, and the data showed up in the state of FinOps, 35% are now being asked to look at the data center. This doesn't mean they're running the data center. They're not putting their hands on the hardware, they're not doing ITIL, they're not in there, but they're asked to become a reporting layer a data-driven layer to help speed up decision-making into more proactive capacity management, planning management. Tough word to say. So in this same model, we see these capabilities being applied across this area. We heard at the San Diego conference four months ago, Uber saying, we're doing this across four clouds and also in our data centers. We heard Meta saying, based on our business strategy, we need to clear out more quickly data centers, CPUs, to make room for GPUs. So we're using FinOps data to help us figure out how to do that. Big companies doing this, and it's starting to trickle down to smaller ones as we go. The whole approach, though, is a plus one, right? So nobody's doing FinOps across all these yet. Or if you are, come and find me and tell me about it. But it's always like, you know, cloud plus licensing, which turns out 53%, big number looking at licensing. Or it's cloud plus private cloud, about 37% are doing that. Um, this combination, though, is what we want to see increase over time, right? How do we bring that data-driven decision-making across more types of spend? Again, we're not going to be running the data centers, and there's still going to be license management and things, although we're seeing a huge influx of ITAM and software asset management and all these people coming into the FinOps practice as their careers go that direction. But we need you, okay? Best thing you can do right here to give back to the community, please take 15 minutes in the next month or two to fill this out. It's the fifth year of the survey. This is the data we drive the community with, investment into what we need to be doing, the best practices. So please make a note of this. Don't do it right now. Pay attention to the keynote, but come back and fill it out later, please. <clears throat> okay, so to reflect this change that has happened, the FinOps Technical Advisory Council has introduced a new concept into the FinOps framework called FinOps Scopes. The first version of this went live just about 10 days ago, and it's a very simple concept at this point. We're not yet saying how to do this in these areas. What we have is a placeholder 
for how we're going to see FinOps teams apply FinOps capabilities to other types of spend and reporting. This is all being figured out. This is just like FinOps 2017 or FinOps 2018. Everybody's talking about this. Nobody quite knows how to do it right. They're all using different words for it. And we as a community, and frankly, I'm really fired up personally over the next five years in this foundation, we get to go define this now. This is our next five years of figuring this out. Do you remember this moment five years ago? We were figuring this out for cloud, now's the chance. Okay, so the broader look at technology in more types of spend is also enabling earlier conversations about how to bring cost into product-aware decision-making. We called it this a couple months ago, but we realized it's not just about cost. It's about FinOps-aware decision-making, because bringing the cost metric alone is not enough. You need to bring in the collaboration the data-driven decision-making, the business value aspect. And so what we're seeing now, if you look at a traditional product development process, at the design phase, leadership based on the business strategy works with the product team to define what's gonna be built to go deliver that value. And then they hand that to engineering teams, operations to go build it. And it's not until the thing is deployed and shipped, the finance team comes in and tells them what they're spending. Turns out they're usually spending a bit more than they were planning. And so then the FinOps team is parachuted in to then start doing the FinOps process. But at this point, coming in, they can only have so much impact. Most of the decisions have been made. It's fine tuning, it's little optimizations, it's maybe rate optimizations, but they can't make material changes. Shift left, as we usually hear all of you talk about, starts here, which is at the build phase. How do we think about the architecture that we want to run? Maybe we've decided which cloud we're in, but it's like which service in that cloud are we going to do? Increasingly, we're seeing it shift down over this direction. So at the phase of figuring out what business problem we're solving, what challenge we're solving, what value we need to bring, the FinOps team is coming in to help model the potential costs across those different types of technologies so that you might decide to go this direction, SaaS or public cloud or data center. You might decide which cloud has the right mix of things. Or, as we heard a couple of you say, <coughs> excuse me, you might not build the thing at all. Right? The best way to avoid cost is to not build the feature, right? So bringing it back to here has a big impact. So one of the decisions, constant, constant conversation in product development right now is what do we do with AI, right? And so the aspect of we want AI to bring value, but it might be too expensive, but we're not sure how much we should spend on it is really facilitating the next point in the evolution of FinOps. So this is what everybody loves. <laughs> AI is going to change the world. It's going to write your papers and your code and cook your breakfast and all the things, right? So what can AI do for FinOps? There's going to be a lot of really good conversation about that here. I'm not making fun of it. I'm more trying to get you to think of this, which is how do you apply the FinOps practice to your AI so that you can ensure the business value, not just the cool use of the technology. You're applying it for the right reasons at the right times. This is not an AI conference, it's a FinOps conference, but if you think about those two things together and you look across the spectrum of spend, what this enables you to do, AI is greenfield for a lot of companies, right? They're figuring out, do I buy cloud gen AI services? Do I need to go try and get GPUs if I can get them? Do I use SaaS services? All these things. So as part of this, bringing FinOps earlier, you can make those decisions earlier on. And more state of FinOps data, hot off the presses, shocker, most people are using cloud generative AI, right? That makes sense. You go spin it up, you use it, it's easy. A lot of people are using SaaS-based versions of AI. And then, not surprisingly, similar to the amount of people starting to look at these areas, there's some GPUs being purchased. There's private cloud being used, virtual GPUs. So this gets us to some interesting ideas. Parallels in the FinOps practice. All of these things have usage optimization. So in Public cloud, you might be thinking about optimizing your prompts, right? What you put in, what you get out. Uh, in SaaS, you might be thinking about optimizing your tokens. How do I get the best rate on that? You're chuckling. I love that. Uh, in, in private cloud, you might be thinking about virtual GPUs. How do I figure out the allocations between people? And because of the power needs in data center, you got to start thinking about things like cooling. Why does cooling matter to FinOps? Because I was talking to somebody who runs data centers, and he's saying because the power consumption of the GPUs is so much, they're having to space out the actual racks to keep them cool, and that changes the economics of the cost of running that. This is something the FinOps team has to eventually consider. 
So I'm having fun with the ops. I'm not trying to coin these terms, although if I see them on the internet, they, you saw them here first. Um, but the idea is applying the same ideas, usage, workload, rate optimization to the rest of the business and in AI. It's also a great way for you to bring in new types of spend and conversations in the business, because I'm telling you, personal theory, this, this is not a formal FinOps Foundation opinion, but I think we're gonna see with AI what we saw with cloud five, seven years ago, is people go, whoa, I didn't know you were gonna spend that much. Can you track it back? Well, hold on, we need to get better reporting. We need to get better visibility. Can you optimize? So get ahead of that now when the spending is going so you have the tools, you have the people, you have the process to do that. Okay, GPUs, they use a lot of power, whether you're running them in cloud or whether you're running them in your data center, which is bringing in not just the concern about cost, but also about carbon into the FinOps practice. And this brings us to very intentionally named sustainability informed decisions. So if you think about the business strategy where you're going to be considering your carbon goals, leadership and a sustainability team may have ESG goals, they may have certain reduction targets, they may be trying to figure out what they're going to do in relation to those product decisions they were making. The FinOps team acts as a good in-between to connect that data and those conversations with the engineering and product teams who need to go build that. And as we talked about, it's not just about lobbing them over. It's about bringing in metrics and conversations and data and reporting back and forth in a speedy, agile, cloud-based approach to make the improvements as you go. You all have seen the Iron Triangle. It's in all the FinOps training. It's in the FinOps book. It's, we didn't make it up, obviously. It's like a project management thing that's been around for decades. But it talks about weighing good, fast, and cheap, or speed, quality, and cost. Sometimes carbon and dollars are consistent. Sometimes they're not. They're totally at odds. Sometimes you can say, I want to reduce carbon, but only if it costs less. Sometimes you've got to make trade-off decisions. The whole point is we need to bring cost in alignment with our uh, carbon and water and cloud-related, uh, cloud uh, sorry, sustainability-related metrics, and also with our business decisions. So the FinOps practice, through all of this framework and data that it's used to pulling, let me tell you, pulling cloud data is hard, pulling sustainability data is hard, getting that into one place to make those conversations is key. So one of the things the foundation has been working on and just launched last week is a new set of metrics tied to the FinOps practice and sustainability data for you to start to consider as part of this. We're an open source foundation. That means we get groups together to do this. I want to give a huge shout out to Bindu Sharma and the Sustainability SIG for putting this together over the last few months. <laughs> Everything these groups create, which is why we're in the Linux Foundation and why we do this model, is on the website, CC by four, you can use it. You can iterate on it, you can put it out there, make it part of your practices. Check this stuff out. Now, the next thing the group is doing is, instead of just adding, as we did last year, the sustainability persona and cloud sustainability capability, the group is going through all the capabilities of the framework, and they're seeing where they need to integrate sustainability concepts. Carbon considerations can't be carved off to the side, because it turns out people also care about cost. So we're trying to marry that through all the conversations so you put the right metrics in the right spot at the right time so you can make those trade-off decisions. There's also conversation about whether or when we may be able to look at hopefully standardizing some of the carbon reporting in things, possibly in the future, no forward-looking commitments, things like the focus specification over time. So the last thing, which is really the first thing, it's how we all started, it's how we came together. FinOps is a people discipline, practice. It's about driving collaboration. The business value comes out of the people and the collaboration, the processes. The timely data-driven decision-making happens by then. So this is both the first and kind of the last point in all of this. The decisions can't be made in a vacuum. I remember the days, we'll go back to 2017, 18, 19 again, the FinOps practitioner was like that annoying team with their right-sizing report or their reserved instance report being like, you gotta turn stuff off. Nobody liked them. It was, it was terrible days. Uh, now, the FinOps team is an integrated central driver of these conversations, communications across the organization, enabling, rather than just evangelizing, <clears throat> enabling and partnering with the other teams. And it's moved to a deeper integration across the types of titles doing it. So we talk a lot about personas and roles, which essentially are the archetypes, if you will, of the types of conversations each of these are having. But 
in all of these, there's a deeper list of roles. This is why we see the explosion of people in the FinOps Foundation. We see procurement coming in. We see finance, FP&A, and ITFM coming in. Uh, we see a whole set of new roles in the FinOps practice. ITAM and SAM are coming in heavily. We've got, I'm, I realized I was standing in front of it while you're taking, taking photos, so apologies. Uh, we've got, <laughs> excuse me, jet lag. SREs coming into the practice, architects. Many of you have asked, where is architects? Where, are, where is architecture in this persona, in this role? They're sitting here in engineering. They're interacting with the practice in that way. And of course, all the other bits down to leadership and executives who are driving those decisions. So the last one, what's the last point in the evolution of FinOps? Anybody? Shout it out. Any ideas? What? Focus? Oh, that's a good idea. Anybody others? Come on, wake up. I'm going to take two more. I'm waiting for two. Anybody? Anders, what is it? What's that? AI for FinOps, interesting. Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait and find out. So <laughs> all of you are the ones who need to go have the conversations and figure out what this is. What do we need to be talking about next? What's the next thing we need to tackle? So that is the end of the beginning. Now we're going to get into the practitioners telling you about their own practices. We're going to hear themes around Beyond Public Cloud, around how managing AI from the FinOps perspective, around sustainability, around all these areas of uh, FinOps-aware product decisions. Our first speaker, I'm going to welcome out, has been a longtime community member and is running a very mature practice at a big bank that touches on all of these themes. I'm very excited to welcome to the stage Natalie Daly from HSBC. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to FinOps X Europe. I'm really happy and excited to be back here with you um, and on the FinOps stage. Um, those of you who might not know me, my name is Natalie Daly, and I am the head of cloud economics and FinOps at HSBC, which for us is our full technology stack, which is public cloud, private cloud, and also on-prem. So today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the successes and advancements that we've made since the last time I was up here, and also how we have approached moving our FinOps capability beyond our public cloud infrastructure. So I'd like to begin where I left off last time I gave a keynote, which is with this slide. And it was to depict where I thought we would be taking FinOps at HSBC. So how many of these things are actually a reality for us today. I'm pleased to say all of them, and a few others have creeped in as well. Um, we are absolutely focusing on shift left. Uh, JR touched on this earlier, so being more FinOps minded when thinking about products or releasing into our environments, but also automation, especially around our optimization tactics. The wider value proposition, so how we're leveraging FinOps data and FinOps analysis to help underpin strategic decisioning and help drive data-driven decisioning. FinOps scopes, which was previously on my slide as full stack FinOps, so it's now known as FinOps scopes, but how can we apply our FinOps capabilities, processes, and our learnings from public cloud to a wider technology overview? AI for FinOps, of course, AI had to creep in there. But for us, that's more about working within our risk and compliance frameworks with AI and working out what are the right use cases for AI within a FinOps um, environment. And then, of course, sustainability. So how we can further move along the sustainability uh, agenda for our organization. So hopefully, some of you will remember this slide. This is our maturity view of our optimization tactics and the levers that we were pulling back in June 2023. That was the last time I was here in San Diego. And the idea of this was to, to depict the kind of optimization tactics we were running, the levers we were pulling, and where it was present across all of our CSPs. So fast forward today, how has this view changed? Well, you'll see that many things remain, um, but may have moved across the grid 
Now, as we increase the breadth and depth of our optimization opportunities that we, we share with our organization, we're also looking at more complex um, opti optimization activity. So you'll see that now we have more in that run stage. And that's mainly due to complexity or time or effort required to deliver some of the optimizations, not just from the FinOps capable point of view, but also from our businesses in terms of testing, engineering, dedicating time, but also where we've been able to end-to-end -to -end fully automate some of our optimization tactics. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on that moving forward. So under shift left, I'm going to talk predominantly around what we've done around optimization automation. And I think the first thing to say is that automation has to be within the risk appetite of your organization. And that will be different for all of us. It needs to be a consideration when you are thinking about and targeting which optimization tactics you think are suitable for automation. And also, it has to fit within the overall optimization strategy. Also, I think it's one of the key things to adoption is ensuring that you have built that trust with your organization. So sometimes going straight to automation for your optimization tactics may not necessarily be appropriate. Sometimes delivering an MVP, working with a business or piloting, having manual steps, proving the value is the way to build that confidence with your new organization and then taking some of those manual steps and automating those can help build that relationship and that confidence. So let's bring it to life with a few examples. Automation, resource housekeeping, all the good activities we should be doing consistently across all of our platforms and also doing regularly. Now, those are things like power scheduling, deletion of unattached disks, eliminating waste, reducing our usage footprint. Now, for us, many of these started off as manual activities. Analysis was done, recommendations were made, and the businesses were invited to, to take action. We've now, what we have implemented is uh, fully automated processes around our housekeeping activities, which take action in our dev environments based on predefined um, parameters with the businesses and working with our platform teams, ensuring that it's tested and deployed across each of our platforms. But essentially, the code that was written by FinOps engineers within my team are actually taking those actions on, on our dev environments. So, for example, applying a power schedule or after a predefined period, deleting an unattached disk. Also, there are native products and services on our CSPs that help us optimize our environments. Storage, I'm sure you're not surprised, is one of the biggest cost categories, and each of the platform has a solution that can help with that. So what we've done within our FinOps capabilities, again, FinOps engineers within my team have written the code to then enable some of these native functionalities on our new workloads as they arrive into our environments. And again, with predefined categorization and predefined parameters, according to the business, it takes action within our dev environments. Production can be different. Whether or not, again, your risk appetite of your organization, a centralized team making changes to production, some, some organizations are supportive of that, others, it's more of a challenge. For us, what we have done from a production point of view the same code identifies the same types of opportunities, but it presents itself on our, as a non-critical compliance violation. And that feeds into our existing compliance dashboards that have remediation SLAs for the, for the organization and the engineers to take action. And then all of this is then picked up by our benefit tracking and realization processes, and the actual specific benefits realized within our business lines as a result of these enforcement policies is then tracked and played back real time. So that whole process is end to end. And those tactics started as manual tactics within our environments. So how have we been able to deliver further value? So over and above automation within our optimization portfolios. So 
technology business driving business value, data-driven decisioning. There are many ways that you can apply this, and we've, we've utilized and leveraged our existing FinOps pillars, so all the data that we've gathered over the years that we've been doing this on public cloud, and also <clears throat> the associated analysis with, within um, those data constructs. So one of the key examples of how we've done this is looking at CSP pricing changes. These happen quite regularly. They can happen at the overall product level. They can happen within a component of a product, or it can be pricing changes or something that was previously not charged for. From a business point of view, it's really difficult to aggregate that up and understand how that impacts their organization. So what we have done is taken our existing data, billing trends, object life cycles, understanding patterns and behaviors from our businesses, taken each one of those CSP price changes and played that back to the business in what it means to them using their data. Being able to tell them from a line by line point of view what that impacts them, how it impacts them, but also full year and rest of year. And then we've then taken that a step further and said, here are some mitigating actions for how you can offset that. And that's taken the form of optimization. Sometimes you can offset that with optimization, but also being able to make recommendations on changes to business process to actually impact the way that that cost lands within that organization. Minimum revenue commits. I'm sure many of us are familiar with what those are. Um, and as you move through your maturity journey in your organization, you'll have different types of minimum revenue commits. I think the FinOps capability is in a prime position to help an organization understand how they're trending against their minimum revenue commits, but also to use your forecasting data to think about how, how outward modeling and how we'll be moving, moving forwards. Bringing that data in and working with finance, for example, can help with financial target setting on a yearly basis, and also, in some cases, help inform application placement decisioning. And then the last example I have is around different lenses on the data that you hold within FinOps. So aligning them to businesses, uh, consuming entities, I think that's how you position your FinOps capability in the early days. But what you can also do is pivot that data for other organizations and other stakeholders that have a slightly different lens and slightly different interests. The example I've used here is your regional businesses and markets who are then beholden to your regulators and will be looking at the data and wanting insights from the data from a different angle. So being able to pivot that and align to those demands, I think FinOps teams are in a great position to help do that. Okay, so moving away from public cloud, how have we thought about migrating our FinOps practices and capabilities onto our wider technology stack? We've begun the journey and we've think been thinking about, you know, how does FinOps work with existing processes, existing tooling and existing methodologies that traditionally are looking at our on-premise infrastructure and private cloud. And, and what has FinOps got that's different or that can help elevate some of the existing data sets that we have? And I think there's two key themes for me that keep recurring and coming out. And that's firstly around the granularity of data and how, as FinOps practitioners, how we utilize and leverage data. I think traditionally on-premise, the way that data is pulled together is granular, large data sets, but it's focused predominantly on finance processes and charging and billing. I think the nature of FinOps and the nature of um, FinOps practitioners, always looking at data, always developing insights, finding opportunities, and having a real deep understanding of what the story the data is telling you. And from that, you can have a, a depth view on granularity, but also your cost drivers, what it is that's driving your cost in that environment and end-to-end. -end. And as a result, come up with optimization opportunities and insightful um, actions that can be taken. I also think that FinOps teams are used to dealing with large data sets and have established processes and tools 
to help drill down into that data and produce what is actionable insights for your full technology stack. And I think by leveraging this, you can promote FinOps everywhere, end-to-end, -end, in all of your um, technology footprint. I think the other area that comes to mind is culture. Right at the heart of FinOps is bringing together siloed teams, bringing together teams that don't generally talk to each other or interact with each other. And I think that FinOps is exceptionally good at doing that. On-premise infrastructure is different in terms of what I call that instant gratification. On public cloud, you make an optimization, you can see your cost coming down. On your on-premise infrastructure or your private cloud, that's less costs are more sticky, and it's more of a long-term play. I think what FinOps can help happen is uh, implement that level of culture, bringing those teams together, and working in a cohesive and collaborative way. Driving the organization to be focused on driving out optimization, and then um, hopefully then looking at ways that you can re reduce cost. It's the collaboration and all of the teams pulling together that ultimately, with time, will make an impact to your overall cost base. And I think we all agree, being efficient and eliminating waste, irrespective of where you are, or from a technology point of view, is the right thing to do. Also with a FinOps culture, I think, is our ability to translate benefit. And I think this is something that the existing processes struggle with. So not just the translation of the cost itself, but the benefit driven from your optimization activities. That's definitely something that is a value add for an organization. <clears throat> and then lastly, by doing this, there are various byproducts. So if you are managing across your whole technology stack, you're going to make better impacts on your sustainability targets. You're going to increase resiliency and reduce risk. And also, Articulate, better articulate your cost avoidance activities, especially on-prem, where you are returning or better utilizing your infrastructure and then utilizing that to fund growth. And that helps to keep costs down across the whole organization. So how has my team changed? What have we done to try and be more responsive to some of these strategic questions that we've been asked? And what kind of skill sets have we uplifted or changed within the team to help us uh, respond and be more nimble, but also take a proactive role in helping our businesses deal with the challenges that they face, and in some instances, identifying and proactively sharing with them challenges they may not be aware they're about to face. So we've got our usual uh, FinOps capabilities and personas across the top, and of course, they exist, but we have added a few new roles. So data scientists, data architects. We have recently onboarded some AI skills, and that's more about helping us with the right use cases for AI and FinOps, and how we can support the business along their journey. Some key sustainability resources as well within the team. And then tooling experts and SMEs, so helping to build that ecosystem around some of our call tooling and helping us flex to, that, to those strategic um, requests. As a result of our expansion and maturity, the organization and the wider personas that we interact with is also growing. And what that means is we need to address two things. The skill sets within our teams, but also our behaviors. Establishing ourselves as trusted advisors and taking a more consultative approach when we are working with our senior excos and our wider organizations. You can see here that we, on premise, you've got um, additional roles that come up around enterprise architecture, um, end user and device teams that we're also engaging, data center teams, on premise teams, uh, and of course, cyber, IT service owners and also the IT strategy teams. And because of this, we've had to revisit our engagement model. There's certain processes that we've had to burn down that no longer serve and create new ones in order to engage with this wider stakeholder group. Aha. 
Why the unicorn? <laughs> I see some confused faces at the front. I, I really do believe there is something special about what we do as FinOps practitioners. Bringing together finance, engineering, translating that to the business, and producing actionable insights to increase efficiency and reduce cost, I think it requires a special set of skills. So I do feel like I'm in a room with fellow unicorns when I'm here at FinOps. As I'm coming to the end of my presentation today, there is a few things I'd really like to leave with you all. Uh, firstly, there is no limit to where FinOps could be applied or is applicable. For me, I certainly haven't reached the limits of where I think I would take FinOps in the organization. On a very regular basis, there are new opportunities, new ideas, um, ways that we can leverage what we have to help the, the business make strategic decisions, do modeling insights, and help the business move forward. So expand the scope of what it is you think can be elevated by FinOps and have no limits in your thinking. I think FinOps is a tangible, applicable, traceable profession and practice, and value can be tracked and proven. And because of that, you're refining your skills on a day-to-day -day basis. Keep focused on doing this, keep sharing, keep learning. This environment here, the wealth of knowledge that can help you advance your practices back in your organizations. You make a tangible difference, um, and making that visible is key to being clear on your value. FinOps teams are assets to organizations, and all of you, I think, are integral to that asset. And lastly, success will open doors. The more successful you are in your public cloud environment, the inevitable questions will come. Where else do you think you can apply this in the organization? How else can you help me or help us solve some of our challenges? So my advice to you would be think about that now. Be proactive, identify opportunities, and lean in. I'll leave you with this. Inops is for life. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful being with you today. Thank you, Natalie. Been officers for life. It takes me, uh, takes me back to uh, some good, good themes we had in previous years. So um, today I want to talk about what is underlying all of the data that uh, sits within the FinOps practice. So, You've heard a lot. How many of you have heard about focus? OK, a few of you. I meant before I talked about it, like 10 minutes ago, right? OK, a few of you. Um, focus is the open cost and usage specification for normalizing cloud spend data and other types of data over time uh, that does currently have 1.0 feeds from all of the major cloud providers. And for the few of you who haven't heard about it, uh, focus really aims to provide a common language for taking the disparate terms, both on the dimensions and metrics, both the descriptive and the measurements, and given a common language between different cloud providers, between different future types of technology spend as well, to get them into a common format. Keep in mind, Focus is not a product. Focus does not have you know, levers and gears and magic behind it. It's, it's really just a specification defining the terms. So the data comes in, is defined into those terms by the data generators, and it enables the practitioners, the service providers, the tooling providers to more quickly get to the outcomes because they're all speaking the same language. They can all come in with a common understanding of what's happening. So rather than me going into more detail, I wanted to uh, welcome out a couple of folks uh, who I think are, are very well suited to this uh, with like what organization has to unify lots of different you know, constituencies and languages together into a common format. Uh, and we're very excited to have this group out because they're early users of Focus. They're going to talk about how they're using it in their very federated large organization uh, and some of the challenges they're already seeing and where they want to see in the future. So please welcome to the stage Julian and Nevin from the European Parliament. Good morning, everyone. We're really happy to be here with you today. 
My name is Nevin Drljevic. I'm the head of software and cloud assets management at the European Parliament. And I'm Julian Radu. I am actually a project leader in charge of cloud management FinOps for the European Parliament. And we are here today to talk to you about how are we federating FinOps at the uh, European Parliament, where we are talking about using the focus format in order to create cost data interchange amongst the European Union. What is the European Union? I think that everybody is pretty well aware of that. What about its institutions? You see actually a bunch of logos, not very, very self-explanatory. We have actually the 12 stars of the European Union actually standing for perfection and unity among these, among these people. But there is something more to that. In fact, if we're looking at it from a legal perspective, we're talking about a legal personhood of seven institutions, the European Parliament, which represents the voice of the citizens, the European Council and the Council of the European Union, which represents the member states, the European Commission, which is our executive, the Court of Justice, the Court of Auditors, European Central Bank, as well as 12 other bodies, more than 40 agencies. So this is a big ecosystem of over 70 entities, where in fact we have over 60,000 uh, officials and about 10 billion euros of administrative budget each year, which represents about 7% of the overall EU budget. As we're talking about public money, of course we have to be efficient in spend. We are custodians of the public purse of the citizens' money. Therefore, when we're talking about, let's say, areas where we don't have policy disagreements, where there's a common good, like IT, you always collaborate and try to make it more efficient. This is in case, uh, in particular, the case with uh, cloud, where the European Commission is acting as cloud broker for the institutions, where they are in fact the ones who hold the uh, hyperscaler contracts for the institutions, they get invoiced and then they charge us back. So the Parliament is one of those 70 institutions which get charged back by the Commission. Now, of course, to be able to do that, we have to have some systems in place. We have to be able to communicate about how is this uh, invoicing happening. So on the Commission side, there is an infrastructure cost control system which is focused on showback chargeback. It connects to all the contracted providers, provides also the brokerage fees that they put on top, but importantly, it's intended for the central account teams of each institution. That's great for the European Commission. What about what we need at the European Parliament? We are actually on the lookout for a tool that actually can uh, have specific capabilities to acquire our needs. And for this, we are looking at more granular information that we can bring at the fingertips of our stakeholders, because the Commission is giving you big data, I would say, at, big, um, at a bigger level. We need it actually to make that more granular. Also, we need it um, to look at a tool that eventually can buy off the shelf much easier. But we can also um, have negative connectors towards all the major hyperscalers, but also acquire the possibility to connect to more non-standard uh, tooling that we can find around. And therefore, we had this challenge. Okay, we have the connections <coughs> to hyperscalers directly. That's great. But what about all the other data? What about the brokerage fees? What about the smaller uh, providers which we don't want to necessarily build custom connectors to? Obviously, the ideal is that we bring in the data from the Commission systems, which already exist, where the data is already there. We started talking about this with the Commission colleagues for a long while. In 23, we intensified those uh, conversations. There was always the problem. Okay, what is the format of this data? If they build something specific for us, for our system, we're one client out of 70. It will be something bespoke. It will be something non-maintainable, something that that is just for one, that others have to really expend a lot of effort to build towards. So it's not efficient, it's not economical, it's not effective. This is actually how we came up with a solution. So it took us a few months of looking at the challenge and uh, while discussing uh, with our technical teams, um, the solution came as a no-brainer. It was actually the focused format. This mainly has the merit of being scalable, and this is very important for us because the Commission ensures not only services to us, but also to more other institutions. Scalability is very important. Therefore, by using Focus, 
what we accomplish is that we achieve a standardization. So there is an open industry standard format for how the cloud costs are described. That enables automation. We can automate the data transfers. We can create system-to-system uh, -system transactions rather than having exports that are manually modified, normalized, etc. Of course, that also means that we can do more frequent data transfers. We ensure that that data is accurate and usable. As we always know, if there's a human touch, there's always more a chance of errors and uh, inaccuracy creeping in. And ultimately, as Julian said, it means it's a solution that is reusable, that is scalable towards all the clients of the institutions. And it means that once the Commission builds one connector towards a cloud provider, everyone who is in the ecosystem can take advantage of it directly. Therefore, it was identified as the way forward by the leadership of both the Commission and the Parliament, by the product teams, as we are using FinOps terms, so the uh, project leaders, the technical leadership, as well as the engineering teams, and ultimately, of course, the FinOps practitioners on both sides. And with that way forward, we, in fact, started to implement. We went through some iterations uh, with our implementation. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> Uh, so it, it, it isn't that we, it was decided one day, the next day we had the solution in place. It required uh, the engineering efforts on both the Commission side and the Parliament side. Let's go up in the story. <laughs> so as you, what we have here actually is just a schematics of what we had as an implementation. So we have actually two systems, the one on the European Commission side, which is custom built tel telemed um, to acquire their needs. Um, and on the other side, we have our off-the-shelf tooling. The systems need actually to be able to interconnect and exchange data in specific formats that can actually be understood by our system and be reused, and we can actually put it uh, forward, as I said, at the fingertips of our stakeholders. <clears throat> we have to make the use of the uh, Commission's infrastructure that is uh, um, basically they put at our disposal a query service that is based on AWS Athena, and uh, our REST API was inquiring through this uh, querying service to get information from the database and bring it into an uh, S3 bucket, which is actually the storage. From there, our system is going to take it, work it, actually ingest it, work it, and present it in, um, in the tooling. Here you have actually uh, um, a basic overview, in fact, overview of the formats that are supported by the focus format because it's very important to mention that everything that we've seen before is basically done in the focused format. Um, as our tooling has some limitations, we cannot use XML. We have to look at JSON and CSV. We had a problem with um, the file sizes, so we had to look at the smallest format. We chose to go for the CSV. It's even visible on the screen. That is the smallest format, and this actually it was a uh, no-brainer as well. So by doing this, what we accomplished with our infrastructure is that we have automated data transfers between our cloud broker and us as a client. It is in the industry standard open focus format. It enables API interconnectivity of the systems. By doing that, what we also achieve, which is very important to us as a public institution, which is one of the co-legislators that brought about GDPR and the UDPR, is that we have uh, data protection compliance because humans are not touching the full data set, but instead our stakeholders get access to only that data that they need, because uh, based on access rights uh, on their accounts, cost centers, and so on in our systems. The transmission of the data is fully automated in an encrypted uh, way, so uh, data in transit is encrypted, ensuring security and privacy, and we make sure that all of these transactions are auditable so there's an audit logging of everything. In case we have any problems, we can very easily go back and determine where, what, how problems happened. With that, we actually have a very nice concept. You're all going, okay, this is very cool. Of course, it's not so easy. There were many, many, many uh, challenges that we had to find solutions to. And I will use this opportunity to pitch our breakout session tomorrow, if you want to learn more about them. But we are going to mention one of the bigger ones. 
So the main issue was that once we had the solution ready in place, let's give it a test. And we realized that the information came from the European Commission's system, went into the S3 bucket, into the storage. Everything was done perfectly. We look in our system, nothing came in and say, what's happening? There is a problem. The um, idea was that the limitations in our tooling was not able to ingest the uh, information in the size as it was there. So we're talking about roughly 800 megabytes of data that came in in the bucket in one file, and that was only for a month of data. And uh, that was actually not able to be ingested in the system because our system could only take maximum 500 megabytes. Okay. We looked at compacting the information as much as possible. We told you about before actually using the CSV format and everything else, so it didn't work. The only solution we found was to partition the data. And in partition, the data actually was a bit uneasy. We're going to talk about more about it, actually, as Nevin was saying in the breakout sessions tomorrow. And um, then just to, uh, to um, wrap it up on this side, actually, um, we actually used this focus format. This allowed us to um, basically use the query service get the information um, partitioned properly, and use it in our systems. Ultimately, this approach allowed us to have benefits for both the Commission, Parliament, and the other European Union institutions, other bodies and agencies. For the Commission, the benefit is that they can export their full data set in a system-to-system -system approach towards all their clients, who can use it through an open industry standard format. For the Parliament, the benefit is that as the lead client, we actually get our data. We can, in our system, partition it, uh, analyze it, distribute it to our, all of our stakeholders. And for the other institutions, it means that they can implement something easily by using an industry open standard. In a nutshell, standards facilitate reuse of the developed APIs. That leads to the fact that you can easily deploy new either off-the-shelf solutions or easily develop bespoke tooling to utilize those uh, formats. And for us, as a public organization, where, again, we're stewards of the citizens' money, we have to take good care of it, and we have to use it effectively, efficiently, and economically, which means that we have to build solutions which are scalable, which are reusable, and which optimize the use of the resources in the domain. So this is for us a first step, we're still, of course, building this out fully, but what we hope that this is a first step towards standardizing cloud cost and usage data across the EU institutions, other bodies and agencies, which we can leverage into creating unified cloud FinOps practices, which on the one hand have a common vocabulary, have a common approach, but also respect the fact that we are 70 different entities of sizes from a couple of people to literally over 20,000 officials for the Commission or 7,000 officials for the Parliament, where there are different needs, there is different needs of analysis, different needs about how to use the data. But at least the data should be something that is in a common, open, industry standard format. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We're Thank you, sir. Great job. Excellent. So I'm really excited about that story because we've been talking about Focus for a long time, and it's amazing to see it getting out there into the community and people actually having challenges and feedback with it, which is what we want to see iterating on that as we go. So the next speaker I wanted to bring out uh, is somebody who uh, has been very, very, very involved with Focus uh, from uh, basically the beginning. Uh, in 2022, I actually heard a podcast with this uh, gentleman talking about uh, the idea for an open format, and it was really the genesis of how we started the program. So wanted to welcome to the stage Udam Dewaraja, the Focus Working Group Chair. How are you doing? Two years ago, I'm not sure if I'm on here, two years ago, we were standing on stage in San Diego announcing the 0.5. It was incredible. First of all, FinOps and Barcelona can't go wrong, right? <laughs> so I got a question for you. Yeah. We're talking two years ago about the lack of standardization in data, kind of holding FinOps back in terms of 
adoption and maturation. Did you believe at the time that the community can come together, providers, practitioners, vendors sitting together and to, to solve this problem? Uh, I think I kind of had to believe that it was going to come together <laughs> in order to make it work. Um, the Focus Project has been kind of like launching a rocket ship. I feel like we're just starting to hit escape velocity, but there's still challenges ahead. Uh, but it's been amazing to get, as we said, you know, all four of these cloud providers already putting out data, and we're working on two more cloud providers coming into that format as well. Uh, so it's, it's been a big, a big push, but it's really been held together by the community. So I want to thank you for all of, all of your work. And the community. It's, and, it's early days, uh -huh. but... I think the working groups, the steering committees, the community should be proud of how far we've gotten this, you know, on this effort. There's a lot more to go. And it's evolving. So we wanted to share today that uh, last week, the focus working group that Udom has been sharing uh, finished, well, actually, they finished four weeks ago, the next release. And the focus steering committee last week ratified the 1.1 edition. So excited to announce that focus 1.1 is now available. So remember, this is just a specification. So you can go out and look at the specifications ready to use, but it's now up to the data generators, the consumers, the platforms, the clouds to start using that. So Udon, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's in 1.1? Yeah, so we wanted to address three main areas. First, we wanted to expand the spec. We got feedback from you all after the 1.0 about what's blocking you. So we wanted to expand those uh, into those use cases to address those needs. We also wanted to provide better metadata. There's vendors out there, there's practitioners out there that's pulling in this data. You need better metadata in order to consume this. And then lastly, again, right after 1.0, there's going to be some quirks, some bugs, some ambiguities that need to be fixed. So we've addressed those as well. So looking at where we expanded the specification, commitment analysis is core to FinOps. Uh, commitment discount quantity allows you to do some of that important analysis across usage and spend-based commitments. Many of you told us on-demand capacity reservations is needed in order for you to adopt focus. So we've added some support for that as well. And you told us you need to do more granular reporting below the service level. So we've added the SKU meter and the SKU price detail columns so that you can get that granularity. And I'm super excited about service subcategorization. Many of you have cross-cloud reporting, uh, some leadership level reporting that you want to do, migration analysis, workload placement related use cases. Many of these are enabled by this uh, service subcategorization column. As you can see, this is a continuation from our work in the prior release where we introduced service, sub, uh, service category. So as you can see, the cost can flow from something like compute, which is very high level, down to containers, virtual machines, quantum computing, and other things. And then naturally down into the individual services that the different providers have. And we're super excited to be already talking about 1.2. Uh, there's a lot of things that are being considered. I am super excited about SaaS support. Many of you are struggling with how to, how to report on SaaS, how to do FinOps for SaaS. This is being considered, fingers crossed, that we can get it into 1.2. So just yesterday, the Focus Steering Committee and the Focus Maintainers came together and they spent the whole day talking about what should or shouldn't go into the release and what should go into future releases and how do we make processes better. So this is evolving, right? It's just like FinOps, constantly changing, constantly evolving. We're aiming to do two releases a year to continuously improve this because the space can't really sit around and wait much longer than that. So wanted to give a, a huge shout out as well to all of the focus maintainers who put in a lot of hours on this. So this group meets about five hours a week, six to eight sometimes, three or four or five days a week to work through Focus with the support of the contributors. Um, Udom has been chairing it for the last two years. Uh, Udom is stepping down to make room for our next chair, which is Sean Alpe. Sean, are you out there somewhere? Give a round of applause for Sean Alpe. So Sean was a maintainer who's moving into this spot uh, and is going to be helping drive things forward in the future releases. And 
Huge thank you to the support of the steering committee who really enables us with vision and process and has the very important job of actually ratifying these releases out to the public. So this group has been along from the beginning. We also recently expanded the seats in the steering committee to nine. So excited to announce the new three steering committee members. We have Amit from City, Richard St uh, from Adobe, and Chris from Datadog. So all of these people, uh, the new ones are all here. So go talk to them. They're practitioners, they're SaaS providers, we've got clouds. So let them know what you want to see in future releases. While you're here, the most important thing you can do for Focus is go downstairs. There's a Focus lab. Udon, where are you going to be? At the lab. That's I'm right. He's going to be at the lab. Maintainer's going to be at the lab. We're going to have a lot of materials there you can work with. You know, take the free training, take the analysis. Longer term, what we want you to do is go turn on the focus data at whatever cloud provider you use, give them feedback, give us feedback as part of this. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. We'll see you downstairs at the lab. All right. Cheers. See you all. All right. So the next group we have coming together is a panel. And the panel is made up of governing board members of the foundation. These are people who have uh, spent a lot of time helping us figure out where we should go, how do we talk about things, how do things like focus come together. The governing board supports the focus project, supports the framework, supports training, education, and events as well. So this board is made up, or sorry, this panel is made up, coming up, of four folks. Uh, we've got two practitioners and two clouds who are all on the board to talk to you about their own real-world experiences at their respective companies and with their customers across these evolution of themes we've been talking about. So please welcome to the stage Chris and Jimin and John. Oh, I was a little fast. <laughs> okay. Might need just a minute. I was faster than the chairs. Apologies. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Break a leg. Pull mine a little bit closer so I can see everybody's yeah. face here. <laughs> hey, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, like JR said, it's pretty nice and early for a European out here, right? Uh, so we're so excited to, to have you all out here today. Um, we're, I'm very keen and interested on learning about all the topics that were discussed here today, um, talking, talking with the panel here. Um, so I wanted to just go ahead and dive right in. Um, we're, we're seeing a shift to left, which is something that Natalie talked about, is involved in, in HSBC, um, to, to making not cost-aware product decisions, but as JR stated, FinOps-aware product decisions. Um, how early are you seeing these conversations today? And where do you think they should go over time, Ann? Well, backing up a bit, we certainly experienced that the cost decisions were happening after deployment, <laughs> um, when it was, quite frankly, too late. You know, the analogy that we were using is it's easier to fix a vulnerability early in the development pipeline. And if you do it in production, it's incredibly expensive. Well, the cost is the similar analogy that the longer you wait, the more expensive it is. Hmm. So we've actually seen our teams building it in up front in their development cycle. So we have a robust architecture process where teams have to put together an initial cloud estimate. Now, how right that is during kind of the design phase to be determined. Uh, but as they progress through the phases, it gets refined and refined, and ultimately, that's the, the trigger to engage finance, and it ends up being, being pretty close to accurate. Now, where I'd love for it to be is even upstream from that, in inception mm -hmm. of idea. We're still a little bit away from that, but we're getting so much closer to that that it, no doubt that that's where we're headed next. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think we're experiencing the same thing, too, at Priceline, to where um, <laughs> I use the term directionally correct uh, at the yep. beginning. Yep. Uh, and as, you're, as you become more developed and more refined throughout the process, then those, those initial forecasts start to get a little bit more accurate. John, what are you experiencing with, with customers at AWS? Are they, are they thinking about this earlier on in the process? Yeah, well, I think you know, product, product managers, they're really intent on uh, defining lovable products. And when we 
in, in AWS, when we go to market and we try to get to market quickly, we often talk about what's minimal, what's the minimal lovable product. Okay. But it's not just about lovability, right? It's about viability. And cost is a major uh, component of viability. Um, and considering that too late in the process yeah. can just be tragic. Tragic for the builders and the product people involved. The product's defined, it's designed, it's mostly built, and then cost is looked at and it's too expensive. And it's canceled or delayed. And so I think it's super important to bring it early. I think in the definition process, having some sort of cost requirement, not perfect, and then in the design process, starting to estimate it um, so that you know that, like you said, Chris, you're directionally in the right place. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a just a very cumbersome process, but FinOps helps to kind of solve some of that. Um, AI, right? Who who wants to talk about AI? I'm sure you're gonna we're gonna have multiple discussions about this throughout the uh, throughout the conference here. Um, so, so let's dive right in, right? There's been a bunch of discussions about AI for FinOps, FinOps for AI. Um, how are you seeing AI impacting the FinOps space in the coming year? And then also, have you seen the cost of AI being managed uh, within FinOps practices? Like, how have you seen that? Jimin, I'll, I'll ask you first. Happy to. So AI is our, let's start with the AI for FinOps. So AI is already revolutionizing the industry, right? And our customers think AI provides a competitive edge for them. The AI's ability to analyze vast amount of data in real time allows FinOps teams to be able to look into cost savings, forecast the expenses more accurately, and also automate some of their routine financial tasks. And also the gen AI solutions such as Microsoft Copilot also transforming the FinOps space in a way to make it much easier to get jobs done in the core areas of the analysis, insights, and what-if simulations and optimizations. I, the, we, as a cloud provider, our strategy is to provide a good continuum of AI tooling, starting from the native capabilities in the management portal and to making the, to making the data available to the data analytics platform such as Microsoft Fabric, so that to leverage the AI capabilities over there. And also, a customer can use the data to build their own AI solutions or using the partner ecosystem solutions. Right? So AI coupled with FinOps framework and best practices allow the, the FinOps teams to be able to not only drive the cost reduction, but also be able to dig deeper and scale to put their time into business value analysis. So if AI for FinOps it sounds easy, <laughs> let's talk about right, FinOps for AI. So AI journey definitely is still relatively new and also uh, early for many. And also we share the common concern of AI cost could be high. So, but good news is, I think, the FinOps framework and also all the best practices right, will help to remove some of these uh, the concerns or demystify that can use for manage and optimize AI costs. So to keep pace up with the AI innovations, it's essential to start thinking about all the different language models and their impact to the cost, not only just cost, performance, reliability, and uh, many other factors of the workload's needs. And also, the business model is also evolving, so that such that you have to understand the pricing model difference between pay per token versus PTU models, right, in order to really come, up, come back with a maximizing the value of the investment. And additionally, to use leverage some of the commitment-based uh, payment models, such as like Azure OpenAI RI offering, can help driving further kind of cost reduction and savings. So I won't spoil it here, but please come to our uh, keynote tomorrow, as well as breakout session, to learn more about the opportunities of FinOps in the era of AI, as well as the implementation of AI transformation. Yeah, a little plug there for you guys' uh, insightful tidbits to pick up tomorrow. Uh, John, what about, what about in the space of AWS? <laughs> how's, how's AI been impacting kind of what everybody's doing in the FinOps space? I think for the FinOps community, um, one of the things that AI represents is job security. And right now, um, 
especially <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of investment is being made ahead of understanding the business value. And interestingly, um, cost is relatively unconstrained. You know, if you're training a large-scale neural network or you're fine-tuning using deep reinforcement models, then, um, then the FinOps practices of budgeting, forecasting, and optimization become really important. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a big role for FinOps practitioners to play here. And then the question becomes, how do you find the budget? And then FinOps practices can also be applied to other segments of the business, like you know, optimization, for example, to find budget for reinvestment. So I, I see a lot of that happening. Yeah, I, I've noticed that happening in our space as well. You know, we've been asked heavily to invest in, in AI capabilities. Um, you know, Penny, our AI checkout chatbot, um, and just other things, trip planners, et cetera, all being backed and powered by AI figuring out how to manage that cost, right? And so a CFO's like, hey, how much are we spending on AI? And I'm like, well, let's figure that out. <laughs> and applying the FinOps principles to be able to, to figure all that out has been really critical for us. And is there anything in particular that you guys are doing in Space at Capital One? Yeah, and, and John, your, your comment about the job security is like ringing uh, loud and clear uh, because <laughs> the way that we've been thinking about AI, it's a competitive advantage that every company is really embarking on, but it's really expensive. <laughs> and so it's not like our cloud budget is increasing with this new, new technology. So how can we take advantage of AI? How can we do, you know, use the latest and greatest with the money that we have? So our teams are trying to find what are the big optimizations that we can actually make elsewhere that create the budget mm -hmm. in order to invest in AI. So that's one part of it. The other part is we have our, our teams asking, you know, how efficient are we using our GPUs? Uh, we, you know, at Capital One, we have a, a metric that we, we created that tells an engineer how efficient they are using the, the compute or data that they have provisioned. Well, GPUs are just another version of compute, but the telemetry that's coming off of the GPUs is different than what would be coming off of a typical EC2 or Kubernetes-based compute or even a Lambda. So we're having to take some different strategies and, you know, uh, JR was up here earlier talking about cooling, right? We're having to look at the power draw that's coming off of the GPUs to understand how we are using them. Huh. So we know how much a, like, hot GPU should uh, should produce, are we producing that or is it cool? And that's how we're determining if we are using what we've provisioned to provide an opinion on how well we are using our, our infrastructure. So it's, you know, this uh, very dynamic environment right now. Things are changing rapidly, keeping up with all of that. And then how do we provide the right opinion so that we know that we are either on the right track with our spend or not, and what do we do about it? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, when we talk about, you know, looking at the utilization, the efficiency, the costs, right, um, of, of all of those different things that we're trying to do, it seems like FinOps is kind of parale paralleling the space of security, right, where FinOps is becoming everyone's job, right, and, and cost-aware decisions becoming everyone's job. Um, we've seen, like, overarching company-wide initiatives that really draw the lines in these parallels. And so, um, John, I'll, I guess I'll ask you this question. Um, how are you seeing cost-conscious culture permeate in teams who haven't traditionally had to think about it, right? I mean, like the engineers mm -hmm. traditionally hadn't had to think about that kind of stuff, whereas now it's really becoming everybody's job. And then how are they working with their business partners, you in particular, any differently? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, think about, I think about engineers, I think about software developers. And uh, taking a little bit of a step back, um, constraints have always been a part of the software development process. And, and software developers are very much used to them. They, constraints create hard problems and interesting problems to solve. Um, availability constraints, performance constraints, security, and, and cost just fits right in. I really think it fits right in. Um, 
What's sometimes missing, though, is that while you have a clear performance measure and performance uh, goal, or you might have a clear availability measure and availability goal, what may be missing is a cost measure and a cost goal. And that's, where, that's a great interface with business counterparts to define what that cost measure is going to be, what the cost requirements are going to be, uh, and so that the engineers can manage to those. All right. Well, how are things going at Microsoft yeah. <laughs> related to this? What are you, what are you noticing, Jimin? Absolutely. At Microsoft, like many other companies, we have seen the growing imperative of cost-conscious culture. Right? So um, it's becoming more common practices to incorporate the cost implications and financial metrics as part of the project management or decision-making process. In our team, for example, we do the, every fiscal year we get allocated a certain budget from the business. And we do have partner with par the business teams to have regular reviews with the execs on cloud spending. So as we add new services or making changes to the existing services, we'll also evaluate the implications of the cost profiles. If it increases, actually a business approval is required. Right? So I think what we overall is more looking to get to a place where everybody really uh, plays a role in terms of the impact to the, the financial health, as much as like upholding the security standards right, in the company. That way, we're kind of driving a more culture of the shared responsibility as well as the continuous improvement aspect. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, it kind of segues nicely into a couple of topics that have been discussed already this morning um, that we're going to focus, uh, pun intended, on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this year at FinOps X in San Diego, uh, Focus 1.0 was announced. Um, just before us on stage here, you saw the 1.1 release. I know that um, it's just, it's unique. I know I have this unique perspective. I, I, my background is in telecom originally. Uh, and so it's, it's funny because I've dealt with carrier bills and disparate billing systems and invoices and these just trying to make a unified sense of all of that was overly cumbersome. Uh, and so I'm, I'm super happy to see that the FinOps Foundation and Focus Initiative in particular is helping to tackle some of those challenges like earlier on in the process than, than they did with the telco space. Um, so why do you believe, and I'll ask, we'll, we'll come back to you, Jim, and why do you believe that this is important to customers? Um, and like, why was Microsoft so ready to immediately get on board with this? And why are they investing time to, to contribute to that? Yeah. And first of all, I think the, um, from the, as the first provider to implement Focus, we have observed a trend with the Focus contributors as well as early adopters, Julian and Evan, who, Nevin, who are on the stage, right? So I see them as the visionaries who sees Focus really helps with everything from hiring, onboarding, to implementation of the FinOps mm. uh, practices. Right? And the, the key point is, it's not just for the organizations who use multiple cloud providers. It's for everybody. The, the open source specifications really help customer be able to more focus on their business value add activities rather than to figure out cloud specific implementations. Right? And, and with that, also it unlocks the power of the community. Because one customer, if they figure out something really useful with focus format, every other customer can leverage that to their cloud costs. So it's really improving the overall industry, right? But having said that, there's still a lot of work to drive the adoption. Without adoption, it, this is a good science project, right? <laughs> so we really need to work towards to collectively driving progress towards to our vision. Nice. So, John, I'll, I'll pose a little bit of a different question to you. Um, what, what themes are you seeing as important in some future releases? And you can touch on what I asked Jim as well, but I, I really want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why it's, um, it, it's going to be so popular is because any customer that hasn't um, sourced, normalized, and combined cost line items already, they just don't want to have to make that investment. And, um, and so I think that just highlights the importance of service provider support for focus. Mm -hmm. um, 
the you know operating on the cloud involves um, many different sources of, of of spend, including from SaaS providers to develop applications, and so including those line items uh, in focus. So continuing to support uh, more data sources, and then the ways in which um, some of those data are split up and used for allocation, that could be important for for future focus releases. Nice. It's it's good to hear from the providers. I'll throw a little curveball here, in, but <laughs> you've been heavily involved in in focus, right? And um, I'm just interested in you know the the slide that was just up here before you came on stage and some of the new themes and releasing one dot two. Like, is there any is there any gems you can give us on oh, what the scope's going towards? Cer certainly some gems. Uh, but before I get there, um, so when we were in the the one dot zero phase of focus. It was one of those, you know, as a practitioner, I'm sitting here thinking, gosh, if we could do this, it is going to change, like it will be a step change in how practitioners do their jobs. I'll, you know, we don't want to be focused on, not, no pun intended on that one. <laughs> um, we don't want to be focused on sort of the building blocks. We want to be, you know, more up the stack in developing analysis, but we spend so much time kind of low in the billing stack, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I guess it was in February. It was the first time we had three of the major clouds together at the same table mm -hmm. hashing this out. It was one of those moments when I think back in my career, and I think that was amazing to get the three, three of the major cloud providers together talking about billing mm -hmm. with the sole purpose of making it better for customers. Yeah. It wasn't about anyone's competitive advantage. It was all about the customer and trying to do something together. So that was an amazing experience uh, going through that. And we've been through the journey since then. Like since then, we've just continued to get stronger and stronger. And something I am most looking forward to, and you know, cross our fingers, things change all the time, but from uh, you know, in integrating SaaS, at least laying the foundation for SaaS. As a practitioner, it's so important that I am able to show my customers, which are all of our engineers, how much their application actually costs. Today, I don't do that. Today, I show them how much their cloud costs. Um, I don't show them licensing. I don't show them, you know, there's some uh, tools that are query based. I don't show them that. I don't show, you know, how much in um, other commercials for those SaaS providers. The more that we can get SaaS providers on board with Focus, contribute to the spec so it has some SaaS specific things, the customer, which is shared amongst cloud providers, vendors, SaaS providers, you name it, that customer is at the core of that. Mm. And so each contribution will benefit that core customer and we'll be able to just expand from there. So getting back to true technology cost of ownership, which is really hard to do today, will be, I think, a huge win once we're able to get there. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really compelling and powerful points that you made there was about the cloud providers getting in the same room and agreeing upon something. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a big thing that, that's like I said, in my, in my previous experience with the telco, they would never. So <laughs> it's pretty interesting that, uh, you know, that everybody was on board with that. Um, now, and you have a really compelling story about sustainability, and I didn't want to miss out on this because you know managing carbon has become such a key thing for a lot of companies. Um, I, I ordered uh, Chipotle on takeout, right, and they told me like how many how many uh, how much my carbon I saved, right, on the app, and so it keeps a rolling tracker. So it just incentivizes me to buy more Chipotle. Um, <laughs> but I can support that. Yeah, yeah. So how how's Capital One managing the trade-off decisions between carbon, costs, and quality in some of their deployments? Yeah, we're early in the journey for sustainability, but if you think about just any journey, and especially one that's about cloud costs, you start kind of in infancy and you, you move along the curve and then you get into kind of a maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. And where we've been on our FinOps journey is we're getting to this maintenance mode and it's kind of rinse and repeat. But we have new engineers coming into the organization 
and a rinse and a repeat type mode is not going to excite them. It's also very hard when you're talking about big dollars to make that resonate with an engineer. Um, for the most part, they don't actually care. Uh, they <laughs> only care because their boss is telling them to do something. But if you can change hearts and minds, that's when you can have real impact. So the sustainability journey is something that's helping us get there. And so we're working through all the building blocks of that right now, putting together a program that implements best practices in terms of optimization, but translates that into carbon saves. Hmm. And you know, the carbon saves doesn't just stop there. We'll do a showback of carbon saves, similar to our showback of charges. But also we're going to have milestones such that when we reach those certain save milestones, we are working with a third party who's actually going to help us with doing an action, such as planting trees, doing some work in the rainforest, some conservation efforts, those types of things. So we can tie back the work that we're doing for optimization to something that someone can see in the community. Huh. And that will bring it full circle. Now it's a, a discipline that's adjacent to FinOps with a tight connection. And I think the more we can create these connections to real life and appeal to the human, as opposed to just the checkbook, the better off that we will be. Yeah, it's like optimizing in the cloud, creating trees, right? I mean, branches to success. There, hey, this? that analogy okay. works. All right. <laughs> so we, one of the major themes here is like beyond the public cloud, right? You saw a survey of the practici practitioners and like what they're asking to be involved in. I mean, I have firsthand experience with this, right? Hey, you guys did such a great job in the, in the cloud. What about all these other areas of IT spend <laughs> that, that, you, that you can look at? Um, you know, you think about things like you stated total cost of ownership, right? What's my actual cost for releasing this product all inclusive of cloud? and some of the software licensing and some of the usage-based uh, software and SaaS stuff. Um, so among other things that the TAC recently announced and added the concept called scopes, the highest thing on there was SaaS. Um, and so it, it's interesting, you know, in, in my particular world, I manage the entire tech budget, so it's kind of natural progression for me to go into that because that's probably our, our next largest um, category of spend. Um, but in, how are you seeing this expansion, sorry, uh, represented in your own practices? Yeah, so we're seeing, uh, so the, the SaaS thing is completely like what's next for us. That's, that's you know, what we need and want in order to really um, paint a full picture. And the way that we're thinking about that is, you know, we've, we've got these different vendors, but there's also the, the categories of things. So using FinOps almost as, a, a, um, as the de decision-making framework mm -hmm. for how we make th decisions on things that may not necessarily be cost-based. They may be tool rationalization, those types of things. So it all really connects, and I'm super looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, I know, like, we're utilizing uh, the large cloud providers as payment vehicles for a lot of our SaaS uh, applications. So it seems like a very natural progression. Um, I want to ask you, Jim, what, what's, what's the future look like, you think, in the next year? What are you really focusing on and what, what do you see as main priorities, maybe not just for your customers, but also in the FinOps space? Yeah, great question. So Besides AI, sustainability, many of the topics we've covered, I think as FinOps matures, I expect to see more comprehensive the governance and compliance models that can be expanded into these other conceptual scopes we talked about, right? And I also believe the organizations that have the cultural practice, right cultural practices will have advantage of in the next wave of digital transformation. Yeah. John, what about you? What, what, what are you guys cooking up over there at AWS? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really excited about the intersection of FinOps and, and software engineering. I think when there's more accountability there, and given that software engineers are encouraged to be lazy to solve problems at scale without manual intervention, 
I think there's some, um, gonna be some really interesting developments there in solving FinOps challenges that may have been effortful in the past. Nice. And, and aside from focus, <laughs> is, there, is there anything else that you see as kind of the future for, for the next year, kind of look forward to in June at X? Oh gosh, well, I do wish I had the, the crystal ball. <laughs> um, but you know, I think what we'll see is a lot more connection points you know, we, we do, we tend to do, look at these things in a little bit of isolation. You know, we've got the, the, you know, focus being about cost and usage and, you know, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about SaaS, um, but they're really all connected. And I think as we see them build upon each other, that is when we'll see more momentum start to come because folks are going to start seeing how this can apply in real life. And it's not just one of these pieces, it's an actual ecosystem. Mm. And this ecosystem is going to continue to grow, it's gonna to continue to thrive, and it's gonna to continue to have impact. And once this ecosystem is kind of, you know, the engine is really roaring on it, we're really going to see it take off. Well, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for your time today, um, each and every one of you for sticking around with us. Um, really looking forward to these next couple days. Um, not only the connections that we're making with the people, but also the information that can be gleaned just from sitting in these sessions and, and communicating with all these great like-minded people um, all in the same room. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so we're at the end of the content, but I have two things I want to tell you before you go. Um, the first is, uh, this hotel is packed. Uh, the hotel told us we could get 800 people in here. I think we have like 797 here. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is, I need you all to be like patient and kind and have a little patience if you can't get into a breakout or you can't get into Chalk Talk. Now, the hack here is everybody here is hand-selected to know FinOps. So you, if you can't get into something, turn to the people in the, in the row and take them outside or find a coffee and have conversations there with folks. The other thing I want to share with you is on your badge, if you flip it over, there is a QR code. That QR code is for you. This is a LinkedIn QR code. So if you want to connect with somebody else in there, you can connect with me if you want. That's actually my QR code. You can just flip it around, make that connection, uh, and go from there. So that's all we have today. You got about 20 minutes. Tomorrow, back on the main stage, same time. We got more practitioner stories, and we got a panel on sustainability as well as maintainers from Focus. So get out there, grab some coffee, see some content. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Check out more FinOps X Europe content on our YouTube channel playlist. Like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and leave comments and questions for speakers to help our channel. We appreciate your support.